The committee will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. And pursuant to Committee Rule 5B and House Rule 11, the chair may postpone further proceedings on any question of, of approving any measure or matter uh, or adopted, uh, adopting an amendment on which a recorded vote or the yeas and nays are ordered. Uh, our first item for consideration is H.R. 4174. Aaron, yes. Let me recognize, please. Just for a brief statement. For what purposes? Before we start, I just wanted to, before we go into the markup, I just had a brief statement. The gentleman is, 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 is recognized Thank for a statement. You. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I do want to address the bills we have on the agenda today, but first I want to take a few moments to ask about uh, the six motions for subpoenas we asked for and asked to be placed on the agenda today. Let me provide some background for members very briefly. Nearly two weeks ago on October 20th, the chairman's staff came to our staff and asked which items we wanted on the agenda for today's business meeting. We asked for six motions for subpoenas, and we explained exactly what they were. First, it's a subpoena for documents relating to Michael Flynn that the White House has been withholding in response to our committee's bipartisan requests in March. And Chairman Gowdy now argues that seeking these documents might somehow interfere with a criminal investigation, but he held the opposite position on the Benghazi Committee. Second is a subpoena for documents the White House is withholding about the President's top aides using private email for official business. The Chairman now argues that we should wait until the White House conducts an internal review but we have received no date certain and no commitment for all of the information we are seeking. Third is a subpoena for documents about reports that Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump relocated, relocated their personal email accounts to the Trump Organization after our committee directed them not to do so. We asked the Chairman to join us in obtaining these documents, but he declined. Fourth, this is a subpoena for documents the White House is withholding relating to the administration's response to hurricanes in Puerto Rico and the United States Virgin Islands. This request was uh, nearly identical to the one our former Republican Chairman Tom Davis sent after Hurricane Katrina, but again, Chairman Gowdy declined to join. Fifth is a com uh, committee subpoena for documents from Michigan Governor Rick Snyder, uh, who is, withhold, uh, is withholding uh, in those documents he's withholding in response to our committee's bipartisan, bipartisan, bipartisan request in February on the Flint water crisis. The chairman did agree to ask the governor to explain the discrepancies in his testimony to our committee, but he declined to join us in obtaining documents that would show if he was telling the truth. And finally, is a subpoena for the documents the Kushner companies uh, are withholding about reports of abusing, abusive housing practices in Maryland. Members of the Maryland delegation asked the company in August for these documents, but the company refused. Our staff worked to inform the chairman's staff about those problems, but he declined to join our request. Unfortunately, our staff never heard back to our request two weeks ago. Uh, I and other Democratic members sent the chairman six individual letters explaining in detail our exact basis for each of these six subpoena motions. But again, we never received any letter uh, or other response from Chairman Gowdy. Instead, on Monday night, the chairman circulated the agenda for today's meeting and simply omitted any reference to our motions for subpoenas without any explanation. So on Tuesday, I wrote to the chairman yet again on behalf of all the Democratic members, and I asked him to reconsider his decision to block these motions from today's markup. He responded to that letter this morning, summarily rejecting all, all of our requests and taking positions that are 180 degrees different than those he took during the previous Democratic administration. I understand that the chairman may personally disagree with our efforts to conduct vigorous oversight of the executive branch 
and in particular this White House. We get that. But all of our committee members deserve the opportunity to debate and to vote on these motions rather than have them unilaterally block, blocking their consideration. Our House uh, rules provide for subpoenas to be issued by a vote of the full committee, and we, <clears throat> and we are asking for this opportunity to do so. Before Chairman Gowdy became chairman, when a, Democratic, uh, when a Democrat was in the White House, he promised to exercise our committee's authority just as vigorously with a Republican president. He said this, and I quote, I hope I live long enough to see a Republican president. And if I do, and if I'm in Congress, I promise you I will make her or him be responsive to the People's House when they have legitimate requests for documents, end of quote. Today's markup was an opportunity to make good on that promise, uh, but he disregarded our requests. He failed to respond to our letters and blocked all of those votes. Uh, Ms. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, since you are presiding over today's markup, I ask you uh, when will we be allowed to consider these motions and vote on these subpoenas? And with that, I yield to Mr. Conway. I thank my friend. Mr. Chairman, um, I have copies of a draft subpoena seeking the documents the ranking member uh, just outlined, uh, and I would ask uh, that uh, we issue those subpoenas, and I so move. I second. second. I thank the gentleman from uh, Virginia, but the motion is improper as uh, the gentleman has not been recognized for the purpose of offering a motion. Is, may I ask the chair, are you ruling the motion out of order? Uh, do you have a parliamentary inquiry? I do. All right, and that parliamentary inquiry is what? Would you like to state that? I ask the chair, are you formally ruling my motion out of order. Well, I'm just saying that the gentleman from Virginia, of whom I held in very high regard, was not uh, recognized for the purpose of uh, offering that particular uh, motion. A further uh, parliamentary inquiry to my friend, for whom I have great <laughs> esteem, as he knows. Uh, and I do know that. I thank the gentleman. Thank you. Uh, when would such a motion then be in order? Well, the, the, uh, obviously, this particular markup, as you know, has a, an agenda that has already been agreed to, and so those items that have actually been put forth uh, would, would be only those items that would be considered in order today. And therefore, the motion I made is out of order? Uh, as I've stated previously to the gentleman from Virginia, his motion is out of order because he's not recognized to make such a motion. Mr. Chairman, um, I would invoke House Rule 1, Clause 5, and appeal the ruling of the chair and ask for a recorded vote. So uh, in consultation with the House parliamentarian, uh, the chair's decision regarding the agenda is uh, not uh, appealable, and so I would have to rule uh, that particular uh, issue as one that is not uh, actually uh, under the rules that the gentleman from Virginia stated. Reclaiming my time, and this is, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think we, we really do have to um, make a better effort with regard to making this White House accountable. We can't have situations where we ask for documents and then the documents, are, uh, uh, according to press reports, are then relocated to the Trump Organization. I mean that. To me, that goes against all of us as members of Congress. And so I, I, I mean, and I could go on and on. I, don't, I, 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 I appreciate your courtesy. But this is, I, I think we have to be, this is a critical moment in the history of this country. And we, it is, I don't think history will smile upon us if we take a back seat or a side seat and avoid looking into and making this White House accountable, and with that, I'll, I'll yield that. The gentleman's time has expired, but the, the, the gentleman's time has expired. But I will, I will acknowledge my good friend, the gentleman from Maryland's uh, willingness to work 
uh, to in, in a spirit of transparency, and the gentleman from Virginia as well. Uh, I think both of you know very well. I think it was just in a, a hearing just literally a few days ago where uh, the gentleman from Illinois uh, stressed that he had not heard back on a request that you had made from this administration and this chair uh, ruled, not knowing what that request was, but knowing that it was from my good friend, the gentleman from Maryland, gave the Department of Defense 48 hours to respond to that. And I think the gentleman from Illinois uh, would attest to that. Uh, my understanding is they did get you a response. The other thing is I understand that it was not complete, and so I've already followed up on that to make sure that you get the answer. Just, so, well, just gentlemen, you'll just for one second. Uh, I, I want to affirm what you just said, um, yeah, and that cooperation. You called and said, "Look, I want to make sure this is done and done properly," and I think that's the kind of oversight. Uh, we ought to have, but we ought to have it with regard to this White House. Um, and, well, I and, will reaffirm my commitment to right. the gentleman from Maryland that I will work in a bipartisan way to make sure that transparency does not have an R or a D attached to it, and uh, you have my commitment to do that. And I thank the gentleman for his opening statement. So our first item for consideration is H.R. 4174, the Foundations of Evidence-Based Policymaking Act of 2017. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 4174 to amend Titles 5 and 44, United States Code to require federal evaluation activities, improve federal data management, and for other purposes. Um, I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point without objection. So ordered, I now recognize the gentleman from Texas and an original co-sponsor of the bill, Mr. Farenthal, for five minutes for a statement on the bill. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Speaker Paul Ryan and his staff for working with us on this bill and his, for his commitment to improving the way the federal government uses data to solve problems and improve lives. This bill incorporates the recommendations from the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking and the bill I sponsored along with uh, Representative Derek Kilmer, uh, H.R. 1770, the OpenGov Data Act. The Speaker joined uh, Senator Pat Murray on uh, the legislation that created the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking back in 2016. Pursuant to that legislation, the, committee, or the Commission conducted a thorough review of the federal government's uh, development and use of evidence. On September 7th of this year, the Commission released its report containing 22 recommendations for improving the use of data to inform government programs and policies. Taxpayers expect federal policymakers to base their decision based on well-founded evidence and data. But according to the Commission, there are not enough uh, evidence being produced to adequately inform federal decision makers. The Commission found that the federal government lags behind the private sector when it comes to managing and documenting data that could, used, that could be used for evidence building. The recommendations from the Commission address concerns about the ineffectiveness of data management while also balancing the need to protect uh, privacy interests. The bill is the first effort to address several of the recommendations of this Commission. Title I creates a framework for expanding evidence-based capability at various government agencies. It will require the agencies to designate a chief evaluation officer and develop an annual evidence building plan. The OMB will be required to facilitate interagency coordination of evidence building activities to prevent unnecessary duplication. Title II of this bill incorporates the work Representative Kilmer and I uh, did on the Open Government Data Act. The Open Government Data Act requires agencies to develop an inventory of federal data so that agencies and the public know what data is available to each agency. The bill also establishes an open by default standard for federal data. Federal data should be available to the public in machine-readable format under an open format and open license, except in limited circumstances. Increasing access to federal data is important, not only because the public should have access that taxpayers paid for, but also because increasing access to government data stimulates the economy and improves the quality of life. It's a way for us to crowdsource uh, both oversight and uh, development. Weather data is the quintessential example. 
Weather and climate data made available by the National Weather Service of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association are used by many uh, private sector weather forecasters like the Weather Channel and AccuWeather. According to the Department of Commerce, Americans check weather forecasts an average of 3.8 times a day. That means the American public uses NOAA's data that is published and made available in machine readable format over 300 billion times per year. The OpenGov Data Act will uh, expand access to valuable government data like NOAA's weather data so that entrepreneurs can find new and more useful ways to translate the data into something we can all use and appreciate. Title III of the bill creates a presumption that statistical agencies will be able to access federal data across departments for the purpose of building evidence. The bill also creates a structure in which statistical agencies can approve, I'm sorry, can approve the accessibility of government data for researchers and for other entities for the purpose of evidence building. Statistical agencies will be required to access all data under this bill to determine the level of sensitivity and assign a corresponding level of access. As statistical agencies will also be required to undertake a comprehensive risk assessment to determine whether data should be released to protect the privacy of individual data and other purposes. This bill lays the foundation necessary to build evidence in the federal government by expanding the capacity for evaluation and analysis conducted at these federal agencies. This bill is the product of many years' work by Speaker Ryan, Senator Murray, Representative Kilmer, and me. Senators um, Schatz and Sassy were also very helpful. I want to thank the Commission for all their uh, hard work to developing this and helping us create the bill. This bill will help us create a more efficient, transparent, and accountable government, and I urge my colleagues to vote yes on this. I, I thank the gentleman from Texas for his, his work, and as we continue to uh, embark on this particular effort, uh, certainly working with many of the stakeholders that you already have done to improve not only this effort, but continue that process, you know, groups like uh, DNB and, and other stakeholders who have actually uh, had a critical role. I thank the gentleman for his work and his leadership as well as the speaker and those that have uh, been mentioned in uh, the upper chamber. I now recognize uh, the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, uh, for uh, his statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The Foundations of Evidence-Based Policy Making Act would establish a framework to support greater access and use of government data. I want to thank Representative Derek Kilmer and um, Blake Farenhall for their work on the Open Government Data Act, which is the basis for Title II of this bill. This bill would require that agencies make data, quote, open by default, end of quote, and, and develop a plan for building evidence in their uh, agencies. The bill would require that the Office of Management and Budget develop a federal catalog and inventory of agency data assets and that each uh, agency designate chief evaluation officers and chief data officers who would uh, work to ensure that agencies utilize data effectively. The goal of this bill is to ensure that Congress and the executive branch are able to make important policy decisions based on evidence. This is not always currently the case. For example, take the teen pregnancy prevention program. Funding for this program was recently cut even though there is significant evidence that it works and it works well. If we are going to demand more and higher quality evidence from Federal agencies, it is imperative that Congress and the executive branch advance policies uh, supported by that evidence. And with that, I yield back. I thank the, the gentleman. Does any other member wish to be heard? Uh, the gentleman uh, from Michigan, Mr. Mitchell, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the chairman for allowing me to speak in support of the Foundations for Evidence-Based Evidence -based Policymaking Act of 2017 that Speaker Ryan, Representative Kilmer, and Farron have worked so hard on. I'm very pleased to see them embrace these efforts as a first step in improving decision making at the federal level. I want to draw attention to a couple of goals of the Commission that this legislation advances. <clears throat> first, it's the recommendation that this information be more readily shared across the agencies. Second, that the pr protecting the privacy of individuals must be reflected in this data. It's a priority. Third, 
that they develop strategies for effectively sharing data that's appropriate with the public, such as the no information that Mr. Farinell recognizes. These fundamentals are essential to the responsible utilization of the data for decision making in the federal government. What astonishes me is, is that we have to have a commission to decide we should share the data. The taxpayers have already paid for the data. Sharing data within agencies and across agency lines is essential to, make, to ensure effective government decision making for deciding policies that affect America. This, this act will improve the return on investment of taxpayers on decision making here in Congress and, frankly, at state and local levels. Much of the focus of this, the value of this legislation from the committee's perspective will be on the benefits from a policymaking perspective. This is critical. However, done properly, this also provides information to taxpayers and making decisions that they make in their daily life. This legislation dovetails with something I've been working on since I came to Congress, which is the College Transparency Act, which requires that the use of data currently gathered by the government be shared with consumers so they can make effective decisions for themselves and their children going to college. So I view this as the first step in moving forward and providing the information to taxpayers they've already paid for and expect the government to provide. I look forward on building on this legislation, making our government more transparent, and encouraging not only the public sector to make good decisions, but to empowering our citizens to make better use of the data they've already paid for to improve their lives. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Does any other member wish to be recognized? Uh, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Lawrence, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, today I join my colleagues to ask that you allow the members of the committee to debate and vote on these motions to subpoena. This is the Oversight Committee. We cannot conduct effective oversight over, these, over this government if members on both sides of this aisle refuse to work together. One of the things I'm most concerned about is the committee's refusal to fully investigate the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. We have asked time and time again to demand that all documents related to Flint so we can get full answers about what happened. And now we ask you again to subpoena these documents. Back in January 2016, I asked then Chairman Chaffetz repeatedly to hold a hearing about how the Flint water crisis occurred and what government officials, including the governor, Snyder, did to address it. After we held the hearings and demanded documents in a bipartisan manner, Chairman Chaffetz did not follow through to complete the investigation. In December 2016, nearly a year after we asked for key documents to investigate what happened, Governor Snyder still had not provided them. As a result, this committee is still unable to answer critical questions about what the government, governor knew about this crisis. Why did he not answer repeated concerns about the water quality and why families in Flint who are American citizens continue to live on bottled water almost a year after he declared an emergency. We asked then Chairman Chaffetz to allow the committee to vote on a subpoena to get these documents. And instead, he closed the investigation without even consulting the other side of the aisle. On January 18th, 2017, we asked him again to reopen the investigation, and he refused. Now, back in Michigan, a former aide to Governor Snyder testified yesterday that the governor may have misled this committee about when he knew of the high lead levels and the damaging health effects happening to the people of Flint, again, who are American citizens. And yesterday, Governor Snyder's former aide, Harvey Hollis, testified and told, and he told Snyder in January 2015 that there was concerns about the lead in Flint water. When he testified before this committee, Governor Snyder claimed he did not know about the dangerous levels until October of 2015, which is a direct lie. According to the senior aide, the governor also misled the committee, this committee, about when he learned of the Legionnaire's disease outbreak in Flint. 
This is why we need to see the documents, because we need to know the truth. It is why we are assembled here today, Mr. Chairman. Here we are nearly two years after we demanded all of the Flint documents, and the governor will not comply. Is this committee going to let him get away with that? While we have American citizens being, their lives being threatened by lead poisoning, we will not accept this from any other government official. I have seen this committee be relentless in asking for data. We need answers. The people of Flint have had their trust repeatedly violated. They have sat here as American citizens and looked to us to do our job, and they deserve to know the truth. I ask you again and again, and today, on the record, let us vote on a subpoena and compel the Governor Snyder to produce critical documents, Mr. Chairman, so that we can understand what happened in Flint and how to prevent such a tragedy from happening. All of us must not rest until citizens of these United States who happen to be residents of Flint have access to water that is safe to drink, cook with, and bathe their children in. This is a fundamental responsibility of the United States of America. I know that all my colleagues, regardless of whether you have a RDI or whatever it is, if you're sitting here today, you believe that this committee is responsible for providing justice to the families and citizens of this great country in Flint. This is our chance. Governor Smyder may have known in July 2015, we need to know. Is that true? Thank you, and I yield back. I, I thank the gentlewoman for her impassioned plea on behalf of her constituents, and I appreciate uh, her ongoing concern on this particular matter. Is there any other member that wishes to be recognized? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I like uh, very much the Congressman from Wisconsin's Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act of 2017. And for the exact same reason, I want to speak in strong support both of what um, the Congresswoman just said and also what the ranking member raised at the start of today's hearing, that the absolute foundation for evidence-based policymaking in Congress is our exercise of our oversight, is our exercise of our oversight powers. And how can we exercise our oversight powers if we're not allowed to use the subpoena power in order to get evidence from the executive branch as to what's actually taking place. Um, after news reports broke that Jared Kushner had set up a private family domain on a non-governmental server and that he used that personal email account to conduct official government business, that sounded very familiar to us, Mr. Chairman. So the ranking member, the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, sent a letter raising the same questions, the exact same questions that our GOP counterparts had been raising continuously and avidly about Secretary Clinton's private email server, questions about the preservation of emails, the security of the server, and the usage of the systems for classified information. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Chairman Gowdy declined to sign that letter of subpoena. Then news articles reported that within 24 to 48 hours uh, after receiving the ranking member's letter, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump had suddenly relocated their personal email accounts to the Trump organization. Now, I don't know if that's accurate or not, which is why we need evidence-based policymaking and for the subpoena power to be respected. But if it's true, moving those emails would have violated the ranking member Cummings' request to preserve the records as well as the bipartisan preservation request that the ranking member and the chairman had sent to the White House about the use of personal emails to conduct government business. So the ranking member sent another letter to Mr. Kushner and Ms. Trump, the Trump Organization and the service providers asking all of them to provide information and immediate briefings about the state of the private server. Interestingly, when committee staff asked White House officials at a briefing about Mr. Kushner's use of private emails, they said you should talk to Mr. Kushner's counsel about that. And Mr. Kushner, Ms. Trump, the Trump Organization, and the Trump Organization's technology provider have yet to provide one single document to our committee. Our committee cannot conduct 
an evidence-based, credible investigation when the parties in question refuse to answer questions from the legislative branch of government. The questions we are asking seek the most basic information necessary to understand whether Mr. Kushner and Ms. Trump have violated the Presidential Records Act, whether they have taken steps to cure any violation, and whether any sensitive or classified information was put at undue risk because of their use of private email addresses, which many members of Congress have been denouncing. Many members here, including Chairman Gowdy, have emphatically stated for many years that the investigation of improper private email use is a legitimate and necessary and urgent use of our committee's resources. Now is the time for this committee to prove that it applies these principles in a nonpartisan way. Now is the time for our chairman to provide the same oversight to Mr. Kushner and Ms. Trump and other officials that we did to Hillary Clinton. The chairman should put the full force of our committee behind the ranking member's request, or else he should permit us to vote on a subpoena. Mr. Chairman, please join committee Democrats in seeking this information from Jared Kushner, and if you won't, at least permit us to debate and vote as a committee to subpoena this information. Our side of the aisle is getting a very bad case of subpoena envy after everything that has been taking place in the last couple of Congresses. We would like to see that we get our fair ups in terms of information about the improper use of private email servers. I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his statement on the bill. Uh, are there any other members wishing to be recognized? Uh, the gentlewoman is recognized for a statement on the bill. Thank you, Chairman, for recognizing me and giving me an opportunity, particularly to associate myself with the comments that were made by my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Raskin, as it relates to the important responsibility of evidence-based policymaking, the important responsibility that we as an oversight committee have to gather that information and to do what we must do on behalf of the citizens of this country. On September 29, 2017, Ranking Member Elijah Cummings and Representative Stacey Plaskett requested that the committee hold emergency hearings regarding the Trump administration's response to Hurricanes Irma and Maria. Chairman Gowdy refused. Ranking Member Cummings requested that Chairman Gowdy join him in sending document requests to five entities, the White House, the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Health and Human Services, and the Governor of Puerto Rico. The document requests mirrored documents, re document requests sent by Republican Tom Davis in his role as Chairman of the Select Committee after Hurricane Katrina. Breaking with precedent, Chairman Gowdy refused to send the letters to Governor of Puerto Rico or to the White House. No explanation was given for why the chairman walled off the White House. On October 11th, 2017, Ranking Member Cummings sent his own letter to the White House asking for documents related to the federal government's preparation and response to the recent hurricanes. The White House has, refailed, has failed to respond. Instead of holding an emergency hearing, Chairman Gowdy scheduled three members-only briefing with FEMA, the Department of Defense, and Department of Health and Human Services, and these briefings only raised more questions and concerns regarding the federal government response. A. At the FEMA meeting, Damon Penn, Assistant Administrator of Response Directorate, explained that FEMA did not make preparations to shelter more than 35 personnel in the Caribbean office at the time of the hurricanes. And at the HHS briefing, concerns about Department of Defense's response time were expressed. For example, HHS requested assistance from DOD 96 hours before Hurricane Maria to assist in moving medical supplies and mobile hospitals to Puerto Rico. However, DOD did not arrive until more than three weeks later. Still, Chairman Gowdy denied Ranking Member Cummings' request to schedule a briefing with the White House officials concerning the White House's response to Hurricanes Irma and Maria. No explanation was given. We cannot wall off the White House or anyone from our oversight. This is not a political issue. This is about ensuring that our government protects the health and safety of our citizens. And so many of our citizens are still in crisis. So we cannot afford to wait or delay any longer. We need to compel these documents from the White House. And if the chairman won't do it, we demand that he give us a chance to take a vote on the subpoena and have the committee issue it. Because as a recent electee to this uh, Congress, I have known firsthand the, um, the, the, the very intense 
oversight responsibility that this uh, committee has taken on in just a little over a year ago. And it has taken a, the silence to the degree, degree that it took the uh, repetitious um, resurgence of requests and demands under the former administration. We're not doing our job as an oversight committee. We have a responsibility to do our job as an oversight committee. And if our colleagues do not think that the people of the United States of America are not expecting us to do our job and that they're okay with the silence coming from the Republicans in this committee and in this Congress, you're solidly wrong. And with that, I thank you and yield back. I thank uh, the gentlewoman, Ms. Watson Coleman, for her statement on the bill, and uh, the chair would reiterate a willingness to work uh, in a bipartisan manner to, to uh, uh, assure transparency in all regards, regardless of, of party. Is there any other member wishing to uh, speak on the bill? Uh, hearing none, uh, the question is on the favorably reporting of H.R. 4174 to the House of Representatives. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, those opposed? Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The bill is ordered favorably reported and without objection. The motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Our next item for consideration is H.R. 4182, the Ensuring a Qualified Civil Service Act of 2017, or <coughs> Equals Act. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 4182, to amend Title V, United States Code, to modify probationary periods with respect to positions within the competitive service and the senior executive service and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point without objection, so ordered. I now recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, the sponsor of the bill, Mr. Comer, for five minutes on a statement on this bill. Mr. Comer, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before coming to Congress, I served in state government for many years, including four years as Kentucky's Commissioner of Agriculture, where I oversaw roughly 300 government employees. There I learned firsthand how important it is to have a qualified government workforce and how difficult it is to remove underperforming employees. There are complex jobs throughout federal government. Many of those jobs require extensive training and a specific skill set. The standard for hiring to fill those positions is extremely high, as it should be, but that makes the task of filling these positions very important. If the wrong person is hired into one of these jobs, the consequences can last for a generation. Agencies need time to ensure the individuals they hire will be able to successfully carry out their important duties. They must also ensure new managers and supervisors have the appropriate skill sets and management capabilities to oversee other employees. Under current law, most new hires and new managers in the federal civil service require a probationary period before full employment status is granted. Such probationary periods normally, normally last for one year after appointment. During this period, a probationary employee who is not a good fit for federal service can be transitioned out of the government. According to a 2015 Government Accountability Office report, in 2013, agencies dismissed around 3,500 employees for performance or misconduct. Approximately 70% of those dismissals occurred while the individual was on a probationary period. In fact, in each year from 2004 to 2013, most of the employee dismissals for performance took place during the probationary period. GAO found it can take six months to a year to remove a poorly performing permanent employee, so getting rid of the bad apples becomes much more difficult after the probationary period. A longer probationary period gives agencies the time to ensure candidates for employment and new managers will be able to successfully carry out the functions of the positions for which they are seeking. The Equals Act helps achieve this goal by extending the probationary period for new appointments in the competitive service and initial appointments of managers to two years, plus any time spent in required formal training or waiting for a license. The bill ensures that the federal government has enough time to properly assess the performance of new hires before their appointment to the federal civil service becomes final. One year is simply not sufficient for new hires to, mit to demonstrate proficiency in all the critical aspects of a federal position. 
One year is also too short for supervisors to observe and assess a probationary employee's ability to do a complex job. This is especially true since extensive training required for certain positions is currently counted against the time on a probationary period. The national president of the Federal Managers Association, Renee Johnson, testified before the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee on February 9, 2017. She explained, new employees must often master broad and complex policies and procedures to meet their agencies, missions necessitating several months of formal training followed by long periods of on-the-job instruction. In occupations where training takes substantial time, supervisors may only have a few months of work to judge employees' performance. An example from the Internal Revenue Service shows exactly what Ms. Johnson is concerned about. Training for new hires at the IRS takes one year. By the time a new employee completes the training program, the manager has to make a determination as to whether that employee can do the job with little or no time actually observing the employee do the job. Managers have almost no time under a one-year probationary period to make a true assessment of a new employee's capabilities. Likewise, probationary employees may not have time to demonstrate that they can improve and respond to feedback from their supervisor. The Equals Act addresses this problem by requiring the probationary period to end two years after the completion of formal training. The Equals Act also extends the probationary period to two years for new appointments in the senior executive service. Members of the SES play a crucial role in the federal civil service. Their leadership and executive management skills link career employees in the competitive service to political management that changes as administrations change. The American people deserve an SES filled with nothing but the best, and longer probationary periods help ensure the right personnel are selected for the positions. Simply put, ensuring a qualified civil service is a vital component of effective government. The concept of a longer probationary period is not new. Civilian new hires at the Department of Defense already have an extended probationary period of a minimum of two years. The Equals Act represents an opportunity to scale up these improvements to other parts of the federal government. This bill was drafted in response to some very specific concerns from those of my colleagues who believe a one-year probationary period is sufficient. First, there is the notion that supervisors do not effectively utilize the current probationary period. I agree. Supervisors do need to use the probationary period better to evaluate potential employees. That is why this bill requires supervisors to receive a notification when the probationary period is expiring and to certify in writing if the employee in question is worthy of conversion to career status. This helps keep supervisors accountable for conducting performance management responsibilities. Second, there is the misguided concern that probationary employees are somehow deprived of important due process rights. This is false. Employees are well protected during the probationary period. Depending on the case, probationary employees may appeal to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, to the Merit Systems Protection Board, or the Office of Special Counsel. I encourage my colleagues to support this common sense legislation that will ensure the American people are served by a professional and competent civil service. I ask unanimous consent that a letter of support for the bill from the Government Managers Coalition be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. The Government Managers Coalition is comprised of five major federal sector professional associations collectively representing the interest of over 200,000 supervisors, managers, and executives serving throughout the federal government. Again, I encourage my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from Kentucky for his leadership on this uh, bill, and uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I believe that this committee's consideration of the Equals Act is premature and raises significant concerns. This legislation appears to be a solution in search of a problem. The committee has not yet examined whether there is a problem. We have not held hearings to look at the impact of the current one-year probationary period or the extension of that period to two years for the Department of Defense personnel. We have not seen any evidence that Federal agencies 
neither blanket one-year extension of the probationary period for every Federal job. The Committee also has not determined whether a longer probationary period would improve the ability of agencies to deal with poor performance performers or further, or, or further their missions. My Republican colleagues may cite the two-year probationary period for the Department of Defense civilian employees enacted in last year's National Defense Authorization Act as precedent for this bill. However, they should know that the Defense Department did not, did not request that change or otherwise indicate a need for it. More to the point, the Committee has not held any hearings on the actual impact of that change, which undermines due process rights, harms whistleblower rights, and could hurt recruitment and retention. The legislation raises the same concerns. It would double the time during which Federal employees have limited due process and appeal rights as probationary employees. During this period, they may be fired without, <clears throat> without 30 days' notice. They have limited rights to an attorney or a representative, and they are gen generally can, cannot appeal their removal. This is one step closer to some members' dangerous dream of making Federal workers at will employees. Due process protections are necessary to protect against arbitrary agency actions, including retaliation against whistleblowers. The Committee should be aware of the very real danger that unchecked agency action can have on whistleblowers. For example, the Committee has examined incidents involving significant retaliation against whistleblowers at the United States Secret Service. According to a 2013 Department of Homeland Security Inspector General report, and I quote, supervisors and employees describe the U.S. Secret Service as a small and co competitive agency which can make fear of retaliation or alienation an issue, end of quote. The Inspector General also noted in an employee survey it conducted as part of the 2013 report 44 percent of respondents felt they could not report misconduct without fear of retaliation. Given the critical function that whistleblowers serve in shining a light on waste, fraud and abuse, and the reliance this committee has uh, upon whistleblowers in conducting oversight, we should not approve legislation that would result in more whistleblower retaliation at Federal agencies. GAO recently looked at the issue of probationary periods and cautioned that an extension of the probationary period would only be beneficial, quote, if an agency had effective performance management practices in place and it used the extra time for the purpose intended, end of quote. Before damaging due process and whistleblower rights, we should first determine whether an extension of the probationary period is needed, and if so, if so, whether it is appropriate for all Federal service occupations or only certain occupations. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, does any other member wish to be heard? Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman uh, from Virginia, Mr. Conley. Uh, let me just inquire, Mr. Chairman, is now an appropriate time for an amendment? Uh, well, for what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia seek recognition? I seek recognition. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4182, offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia is recognized for, for five minutes to explain his amendment. I thank the chair. Um, this may be a good idea. We don't really know. As the distinguished ranking member just indicated, there are lots of questions about the efficacy of this proposal. I, for one, 
and I'm concerned about the potential impact on recruiting the workforce of the future. Forty percent of the current federal workforce is soon eligible for retirement. How do we recruit their replacements and get the requisite skill sets we need for many of these challenging jobs? To, to government-wide extend the probation period two years creates a climate of more uncertainty, less protection, and I think diminishes the attractiveness of federal service for a lot of people. In the uh, fiscal year 2017 National Defense Authorization Act, uh, the uh, authorizers extended the probationary period for civilian employees at DOD from one year to two years. My amendment, in the nature of a substitute, would replace the provisions of H.R. 4182 and require the GAO to conduct a comprehensive study on DOD and other federal agencies that have lengthened the employee probationary period. Let's find out if it works. We just passed a bill, reported out a bill, on evidence-based policymaking. I'd like to see the evidence of whether two years is materially different? Does it have good impacts? Does it have bad impacts? What are they? Let's have some hearings. If we're not going to spend our time issuing subpoenas to fulfill our oversight role, why don't we have some hearings on legislation that is before us before we pass it out? So, as I say, it may be a good idea. I don't think we really know. And I think it's not based on evidence. And that's why my amendment would get that evidence. It would require GAO to study those agencies already doing this to see what the impacts are, good, bad, and indifferent. And I can assure my friend from Kentucky that if we do that, and GAO comes back saying, actually, it, it works pretty well, he'll have my support. But I'm not willing to take the risk, absent evidence and a careful study. And so my amendment simply would replace the bill before us with a requirement of GAO to come back to us after having studied the uh, efficacy or lack thereof of a two-year probationary period. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Virginia for uh, offering his amendment. And the chair recognizes uh, that uh, the gentleman from Virginia is in a recovery mode and wishes him uh, Godspeed on a quick recovery. Is there any other member wishing to uh, be heard on the amendment? Uh, the, the, uh, the gentleman recognizes, uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Comer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, would like to briefly speak in opposition of the amendment offered by the gentleman from Virginia. The need for a longer probationary period is not new. Federal, ma federal manager groups have advocated for an extended probationary period for more than a decade. Uh, in the 2015 GAO study, Chief Human, Officer, Chief Human Capital Officers told GAO a longer probationary period could help supervisors make a performance assessment for those occupations that are particularly complex or difficult to assess. It's not necessary to wait for more studies on this issue. Most Americans would think that, would agree that uh, Congress punts and delays and kicks the can down the road on, on far too many issues. This amendment strikes the entire bill, meaning the current probationary period would remain the same and the problems that GAO and others have identified would persist. This amendment removes the whole point of the bill, which is to allow managers and employees more time for a fair and complete assessment before the probationary period ends. I urge the members to oppose this amendment. And I yield back. Thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member, Mr. Cummings. First of all, I uh, support the gentleman's amendment. And I was just thinking the only folks that are getting kicked are federal employees. They can't get kicked over and over and over again. And I, I, you know, I often wonder why that is. Um, we have people that run out and talk about people that do like first responding and people who do some jobs that nobody else wants. And they say all these wonderful things about the people at NIH and whatever. But at the same time, uh, every year we find over and over again, uh, Mr. Connolly, that federal employees are getting kicked big time. I remember when we were, they were trying to 
do some um, budget balancing. They balanced it on the backs of federal employees. They said, we're going to take their money and use it for unemployment, I think it was. Yeah. And um, furloughs. And we can go on and on and on. And, um, and I think the gentleman's amendment is, is reasonable. He's saying, okay, let's take a look at this, and if you've got a problem, let's, let's figure it out. Um, but let's not just do a blanket uh, uh, effort with regard to, you know, just saying, okay, we're going to take the one year and turn it into two years, and hopefully that will give you uh, more time. Next thing you know, it will be three years. Uh, and continuing down that slippery slope. And I, I would just say to, um, to all of us that the people that make this place run are federal employees. I mean, everywhere you go, you got federal employees. You got them at the parks. You got them everywhere. And I think they're getting a little bit tired of getting kicked. And so uh, with that, I think the, and I think the gentleman presents a reasonable amendment and one that we should take a look at. And um, with that, I just wanted to make it clear that I support the amendment. Does any other member wish to be heard? A gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I wish to uh, associate myself with the remarks of the gentleman from Virginia and the, and the uh, ranking member from Maryland about this. Um, we're not just kicking federal employees. Uh, in, in this country, we're, we're whipping them. And they have become the whipping boys and the whipping girls uh, of politicians from coast to coast. Uh, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Uh, the rule when employing federal employees um, is that you get what you pay for. It is a rule that applies in many other aspects of capitalism. Um, and if you continue to whip the, the, the federal employees uh, and make their jobs more and more miserable and less and less secure, uh, what happens is the good ones wander off into other occupations and employments. And you are left with what you're left with. As employers, uh, the federal government, we should be looking to make it attractive to work for the federal government so that we get the brightest and the best and the hardest working young people uh, and people of every age coming to work for the federal government, for us. We are the employers. Now, Mr. Comer's uh, bill uh, has merit, uh, and I think it's really worth looking into. And I hope um, uh, my brother from Kentucky recognizes that uh, Mr. Connolly of Virginia's amendment is not an attempt to disrespect him or his amendment or, or his bill. It is not. It is an attempt to uh, give respect to it uh, and to look into it. Um, now, uh, certainly, uh, the gentleman from Kentucky uh, cites uh, complaints from federal managers. And man federal managers want a longer probationary period, and we get that. But, but there are two sides to a labor management uh, discussion, and we need to hear from labor as well. Uh, so with that, uh, I, I urge ad adoption of uh, uh, the gentleman from Virginia's amendment, uh, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Does any other member wish to be heard? Uh, hearing none, uh, the question is now on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley. All those signify uh, in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, signify by saying no. No. Uh, in the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 4182 to the House of Representatives. All those in favor of uh, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the bill is ordered favorably reported. Uh, the, a roll call has uh, been requested. A recorded vote is ordered and is previously announced. Further proceedings on the question will be postponed. Our next item for consideration is H.R. Uh, 1132, the Political Appointee uh, Burrowing Prevention Act. The clerk will designate the bill. To amend title, H.R. 
1132 to amend Title V United States Code to provide for a two-year prohibition on employment in a career civil service position for any former political appointee and for any other purposes. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for an amendment at any point uh, without objection, so ordered. I will now call up an amendment in the nature of a substitute. I have uh, at the desk, the clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1132, offered by Mr. Meadows. Uh, without objection, the, the amendment is considered as read. I now recognize myself for five minutes for a statement on the, the bill and the amendment. Uh, the a Political Appointee uh, Burrowing Prevention Act ensures that all candidates for civil service positions are evaluated based on merit. H.R. 1132 will help to ensure that positions of public trust are filled based on an applicant's qualifications, not on their political connections. Historically, this has been a major issue with past administrations converting large number of political appointees into tenured civil servants. Practice is called burrowing. During his time at the Department of Justice, the sponsor of this bill, Representative Ken Buck, witnessed political appointees converting themselves into career service positions. It drove him to introduce this legislation to ensure the integrity of the civil service. Aggressive oversight of burrowing by this committee and others helped ensure recent administrations had fewer conversions. Last year, this committee sent letters to every major agency reminding them about the rules surrounding burrowing. In addition, the committee passed a law that required uh, regular reports from the Office of Personnel Management on political conversion requests. These oversight efforts were assisted by the regulatory requirement that OPM review and approve all conversion requests and provide a documented basis for their conversion. H.R. 1132 puts these OPM review requirements into statute while also adding restrictions on burrowing. The bill requires agencies to obtain permission from OPM before engaging in burrowing. A recent uh, GAO report found that between 2010 and March 2016, agencies completed seven conversions without obtaining prior OPM approval. Now, instead of a violation of regulation, uh, regulations, agencies will be in violation of a statute if they convert a political appointee without OPM approval. The bill also strengthens OPM's review process because it requires agencies to make a business case for why the conversion is necessary. And OPM will have the authority to deny a conversion if it feels the agency's request is not critical for the agency uh, to meet its mission. The bill provides for additional congressional oversight by requiring any conversion approvals be submitted to Congress at least five days in advance of the conversion. And this ensures Congress is kept abreast of political conversions in real time. It also ensures OPM is collecting the information necessary for proper review of conversion requests. Now, the same GAO report found that 55 of 78 approved conversion requests between 2010 and March of 2016, uh, OPM case files did not provide enough information for GAO to initially support OPM's approval of these requests. By adding in congressional review, agencies and OPM will be on notice that Congress is indeed watching. In addition to the review requirements, the bill mandates that any individual seeking to convert from a political appointee position must first be subject to a two-year cooling off period. Only after this period would an individual be uh, eligible for appointment to a career civil service position. Uh, I urge my colleagues to support this legislation and at this point, I would uh, now recognize uh, the, the gentleman from Virginia, I mean from Maryland, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings, for, for his statement on the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, significant concerns about H.R. 1132, the Political Appointee Borrowing Prevention Act, and the substitute amendment. The bill would make it very difficult to hire political appointees in career positions. It would prohibit hiring a, a political appointee for a career position for two years following separation from the political position. It would also add significant uh, hurdle for 
uh, seeking to hire an applicant to a career position who separated from a political appointment in the last five years. The agency would be required to certify in writing to the Office of Personal Management that the appointee is, quote, critical to the agency's ability to meet its mission, end of quote. It's not clear that uh, these additional obstacles to hiring qualified career staff are necessary. There are several controls in place already to ensure that when former political appointees are hired into career positions, the selection process is fair, open, and based on skills, knowledge, and ability. For example, agencies currently must seek approval from OPM prior to appointing former political appointees to a career position. OPM ensures the appointment process, quote, was fair, open, and free from political influence, end of quote. OPM also reports the results of its reviews to this committee and the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. A February 2017 report found that OPM reviewed just 16 requests by agencies to hire former political appointees uh, from October 1, 2016 through January 20, 2017, and did not find reason to deny any of these uh, requests. Making it harder to hire a uh, former political appointee may dampen the interests of qualified applicants for political jobs and prevent highly qualified and experienced people from, from applying for the Federal Civil Service. We all want the best people in the Federal Government. According to the Government Accountability Office, quote, the ability to convert political import appointees to career positions is an appropriate and valuable means of achieving a highly skilled workforce. I'm concerned this bill would be an impediment to that, and with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Is there any other member wishing to be heard on the amendment? All right. The question is now on the, uh, the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those uh, in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no? No. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question is now on the favorably reporting H.R. 1132 as amendment to the House of Representatives. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the bill is ordered favorably reported as, amendment, as amended. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the, the table. Our next item for consideration is H.R. 4043, the Whistleblower Protection Extension Act of 2017. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 4043 to amend the Inspector General Act of 1978 to reauthorize the Whistleblower Protection Program and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open to an amendment at any point without objection. So ordered, I now recognize the gentleman from Iowa and the sponsor of the bill, Mr. Blum, for five minutes for a statement on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. H.R. 4043 makes permanent a successful pilot program to educate federal employees regarding the rights related to blowing the whistle on government waste, fraud, and abuse. As members on both sides of the aisle have made clear in our committee, whistleblowers are indispensable in making the federal government work more efficiently. However, too many federal employees remain unaware of the legal framework that Congress put in place to protect whistleblowers after they come forward. Recognizing that problem, Congress in 2012 created the Whistleblower Ombudsman Program. Under the Ombudsman Program, agencies, agency inspectors general select an individual to serve as the agency's chief educator on whistleblower protections. The Ombudsman, to be renamed the coordinator pursuant to H.R. 43, is a central educational resource for agency employees who are considering reporting waste, fraud, and abuse. 
The 2012 Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act created the Ombudsman Program with a sunset provision for three years. Congress extended the program in 2014 so that it would last until November of 2017. During that time, the Whistleblower and Government Transparency Community has pointed to the effectiveness of the Ombudsman Program. With the Ombudsman Program, agency employees have been more empowered to make whistleblower claims. That empowerment ultimately benefits the country as a whole and makes the federal government more efficient. I urge my colleagues to support this bill and make permanent the successful pilot program, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his leadership on this bill. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Cummings for his statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to start by thanking uh, Representative Blum for introducing this bill with me. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your support in considering it today. Senators Grassley and McCaskill have a companion bill in the Senate. This bill is strongly bipartisan. The Whistleblower Protection Extension Act would require every Inspector General's office to have a whistleblower protection coordinator. The Whistleblower Protection Coordinator would help educate agency employees about whistleblower protection laws. This would help employees who want to blow the whistle know their rights, and it also would inform agency management that it is against the law to retaliate against whistleblowers. The bill would require whistleblower protection coordinators to provide whistleblowers who have suffered retaliation information about options to have their allegations evaluated. No matter how strong we make our whistleblower protection laws, they will not work if whistleblowers cannot figure out how to use them. The bill would ensure that whistleblowers have an independent lifeline in the Office of the Inspector General to help guide them through the process. This bill would make permanent a pilot program that was enacted as a part of the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. And I'm sure that the sponsor, Mr. Blum, uh, one of the main reasons why he uh, and I are putting forth this bill, and I think we agree on this, we've seen testimony before this very committee where whistleblowers have come and they were shaking in their boots. I mean, really, I mean, it was really sad. And we, we sat here, we sit here and we say, you know, we're going to protect you. We're going to do everything we can. But I know, like he, like I, when we walk out the door, we wonder whether whether we can effectively do that. And we try over and over and over again. And this is just a, another way of having somebody that they can go to and say, you know what, I'm having a problem. I'm worried. You know, hold my hand. And to have that person in the office of the Inspector General is a perfect place to have them uh, because that puts more teeth uh, in the bite if, if something happens uh, with regard to retaliation and things of that nature. So uh, again, I want to thank uh, Mr. Blum for his, uh, his work and thank him for allowing me to join in with him. Uh, this is a good bill and I hope that uh, you all will support it. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I, I thank uh, the gentleman from Iowa, uh, Mr. Blum, and the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for their leadership on the protection for whistleblowers. There is uh, no greater protection that must be enshrined uh, and protected by this committee. And I can I can say that uh, whistleblowers uh, shouldn't have to fear uh, an administration. Uh, of one particular uh, party or another. They should have uniform protection, and I thank both of you for your leadership. Is there any other member wishing to be heard? Mr. Chairman? Uh, for what purposes does the gentleman from Iowa seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. A clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 4043 offered by Mr. Blum of Iowa. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and the gentleman from Iowa is recognized for five minutes to explain the amendment. Mr. Chairman, the purpose of my bill is to eliminate the sunset provision on the whistleblower ombudsman program. However, when I drafted it, we expected the bill to be enacted before the sunset takes effect on November 27 of 2017. That may no longer uh, be the case. This amendment provides for a retroactive effective date 
meaning even after the sunset provision triggers, the current bill can revive the program. The whistleblower ombudsman program is an important and effective way. Would be whistleblowers uh, to get help, and this amendment would ensure its continuation even if the underlying bill is not enacted before November 27th. I encourage my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman for his clarifying amendment. Is there any other member wishing to be heard on the amendment? Okay, the question is now on the amendment. All those f in favor of uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question is now on the favorably reporting H.R. 4043 as, amendment, as amended to the House of Representatives. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. In, all those opposed signify by saying no. Uh, in the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The bill is ordered favorably reported as amended. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Our next item for consideration is H.R. 4171. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 4171 to amend Title V United States Code to extend the authority to conduct telework travel expenses test programs and for other purposes. I ask uh, unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point and without objection it is so ordered. I now recognize the gentleman from Montana. Uh, the sponsor of the bill, Mr. Giaforte, for five minutes for a statement on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In uh, 2010, Congress passed the Telework Enhancement Act. Among other things, the bill incentivized federal agencies and specifically the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to embrace telework by waiving the requirement that the agency must pay travel expenses for when, for when teleworkers return to headquarters. Before the Telework Enhancement Act pilot program was in place, USPTO only had two types of tele teleworking employees. The first were local teleworkers who were required to live within a 50-mile radius of USPTO campus. The second were teleworkers who lived beyond the 50-mile radius but had to return to USPTO's main campus in Alexandria 13 times a year to maintain their duty station. With the pilot program, USPTO expanded its full-time teleworking workforce to allow employees to reside anywhere in the country and forego the routine reporting to a USPTO campus. For example, in my home state of Montana, the pilot program allowed USPTO to place four patent examiners in Bozeman, Butte, Billings, and Missoula. These four examiners reside amongst the communities they serve and only return to a USPTO campus for training that cannot be completed online. The increased telework brings other cost savings as well and enhances workforce recruitment and retention benefits. USPTO estimates the agency's telework program saved $77.4 million in fiscal year 2016 it also increased personnel retention. The pilot program is set to expire in December of this year, absent congressional action. USPTO has requested an extension, and my bill extends the program by three years in order to give USPTO the time to absorb the travel costs of pilot program personnel. I urge my colleagues to support the bill. In closing, I'd like to address the issues of telework accountability. The Subcommittee on Government Operations held a hearing in December of uh, 2016 on a report detailing potential time and attendance abuses at USPTO by both teleworkers and employees who physically report for duty. The Department of Commerce Inspector General found nearly uh, 288,000 unsupported hours over a 15-month period at the agency accounting for nearly $18.3 million in potential waste. While I appreciate the reforms the USPTO has made to stop time and attendance abuse, the committee intends to review how the agency implements the IG's recommendations. The committee must ensure that telework is used responsibly at USPTO and all agencies of the federal government. The American people deserve nothing less. Again, I urge support for the bill, and I yield back the remainder of my time. 
I uh, appreciate the gentleman from Montana's leadership on this important piece of legislation. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, for a statement on the bill. I thank the chair, uh, and I uh, I'm pleased to be an original co-sponsor of uh, this bill, extending PTO's Telework Enhancement Act pilot program. Uh, and I would certainly echo the comments of my, our new colleague from Montana. Uh, to me, telework is, uh, is something that goes hand in glove with technology. And uh, the chairman uh, and the ranking member and so many other members, uh, Will, Will Hurd, who's not here today, uh, and of course Robin Kelly uh, from Illinois, we've worked hand in glove uh, to try to modernize IT and, and, and push the federal agencies to deploy them creatively, to see the role of IT as something that can be transformative. As we look to recruiting the workforce of the future, the millennial generation is going to take it for granted that we have a flexible workplace, that uh, you know, mobile devices allow us to work from anywhere, and that a structured telework program, of course, will be in place. Uh, if you're going to attract the talent of the future, you're going to have to deal with that. We also know that telework is important in terms of continuity of operations. We here in the nation's capital have had uh, terrorist incidents, we've had natural disasters that have precluded physically people going to the place of employment. Telework programs in place allow us to continue to serve the American people without interruption. They can also save money. As my friend from Montana pointed out, the estimate here is the pilot program saves $77.4 million. That's one pilot program in one agency. The potential cost savings are considerable. So this committee, which has always been supportive of telework, uh, needs, to, uh, needs to give uh, additional pushes, both on the IT modernization side, the chairman and I have worked so hard for, but also the deployment. Telework is a tool predicated on the use of IT that can really be transformative. And I would finally add, as, the local, as a local member of Congress representing the National Capital Region, telework can have an appreciable impact on the congestion that plagues us daily. Uh, and uh, so long as it's a structured program, and as my friend from Montana points out, so long as we also call out any bad actors, don't, don't let them taint a good program that does good things, that gives us additional capabilities, because someone cheats. Let's, let's ferret out people who are abusing it, but not lose sight of the fact that this is a powerful tool uh, that can really make government more product productive and efficient and save money for taxpayers. So I've, I thank my friend from Montana for his leadership in this bill. I'm proud to be his original Democratic co-sponsor. I urge my colleagues to approve the bill. I yield back. I thank you both for your work on this particular uh, bill. I look forward to working with both of you on the accountability as we move forward to make sure that any bad actors do not uh, put this in jeopardy. And the gentleman from Virginia knows uh, good, well, uh, good and well uh, our bipartisan work on behalf of the federal workforce here in uh, many times in his district. So are there any other members wishing to be recognized? All right, seeing none, the question is on favorably reporting H.R. 4171 to the House of Representatives as, uh, uh, and all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The bill is uh, ordered favorably reported, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Uh, Next. May I inquire of the chair just one quick question? Uh, uh, the, the gentleman will state his inquiry. Uh, do we have any uh, idea when the recorded vote might occur, just for planning purposes? Uh, probably at the most inopportune time for you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, obviously we've we've got two others, so it, it should be coming up fairly fairly shortly. Uh, and by fairly shortly, that is in real time, not in congressional time. So I thank the chair. Um, all right. I mean, right after we finish, uh, so I, I, I can give my members notice. Uh, I, I think we intend to do it right after. Right after. Right we, after we finish. Uh, um, uh, 
uh, pending uh, no other conflicts. So uh, our next item for consideration is H.R. 3121, the All-American Flag Act. Uh, the clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 3121, to require the purchase of domestically made flags of the United States of America for use by the federal government. Uh, ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for an amendment at any point uh, without objection so ordered. Uh, it is my understanding that uh, the, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Russell, will offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute to the bill. Uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3121 offered by Mr. Russell of Oklahoma. Uh, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized for five minutes for a statement on the bill and his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we approach Veterans Day, it's appropriate for us to consider a bipartisan bill to ensure that government agencies only buy U.S. flags made from 100 percent American-made materials. I think we can all agree that American flags purchased with taxpayer money should be made in the United States with U.S. materials. It seems like a no-brainer, but surprisingly, federal acquisition laws and regulations do not uniformly require this. Requirements in current law are inconsistent when it comes to the content of American flags purchased by executive agencies. The Department of Defense and the military departments generally are required to buy American flags made entirely of U.S. materials. However, civilian agencies are currently permitted to buy flags that are manufactured in the United States consisting of only 51 percent American-made materials or sometimes even less than that. This bill will bring all executive agencies under a single rule, uh, uniform with the Department of Defense's requirements when it comes to the domestic content of American flags bought by agencies across government my amendment is offered to harmonize and integrate this single rule with existing law requiring domestic content of U.S. flags purchased by the government. Rather than impose a completely new rule and exceptions for the Department of Defense and civilian agency flag purchases, the amendment recognizes and essentially adopts the current DOD requirements and exceptions. The amendment contains limited exceptions that recognize practical realities such as domestic non-availability. But these exceptions reflect those contained in current law governing the Department of Defense purchases of textiles, including United States flags. I'd like to thank the many co-sponsors who are leading this effort to honor America's greatest symbol of freedom, and I urge my colleagues to support the bill, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Oklahoma. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Chairman, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I support the bill. I think it's a good bill. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Maryland. The chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Sanford, for a statement on the bill. Um, I, I rise re reluctantly because the, uh, the sentiment of the bill I completely understand. Um, uh, the author's uh, intent I completely respect. But I, 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 I rise in objection to this bill um, because I think that ultimately the things that we can't see in life are the things that only have value. And any of this physical will pass by, but again, it is the ideas and ideals of this country that has made it great. And so our founding fathers laid forward this idea of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. They laid forward a, a sacred contract in the form of a constitution, the Bill of Rights. And those are eternal and lasting ideas that are captured in again, the spirit of what the flag represents. But the flag ultimately is just a flag. And if, if, if one can uh, cause a little bit of taxpayer savings so that a family out there working a struggle has to pay a little bit less in the way of taxes, but the flag still represents the flag, I don't think that they care if 48 percent is made somewhere else. I mean, I think that there's a legitimate requirement from the standpoint of DOD code from the standpoint of domestic production so that in war times you have the capa capacity to bring about uh, your war fighting effort uh, without, you know, depending on foreign allies. But again, in, in, the, in, in, in the, the representation of the ideals that we stand for as Americans, uh, 
I, I don't think that that is of, of national importance from the standpoint of our ability to fight a war with somebody else. This is about how we put up some cloth that represents a symbol, that represents the ideals that a lot of folks have died for. And so this notion of protectionism is something that costs every one of us money. It costs more of that working family uh, to produce something. And so if, if, if the cheapest flag is in America, let's get it in America based on uh, content requirements uh, in terms of what the flag looks like, uh, its quality, and more. But if a, a, a flag can be bought less expensively, whether that comes from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, or Haiti, or some other foreign country, and we can save taxpayers money in the process, I don't know why we wouldn't want to mandate otherwise. And so with that, I reluctantly rise, though I admire tremendously the spirit of what this amendment is getting at, reluctantly rise against it based on this larger current thread of nationalism and occasionally even carving in the walls and protectionism that we see taking a foot in this country. I think the gentleman's eloquent and genteel dissent uh, on this matter. Is there any other member wishing to be heard? Mr. Chairman? Uh, the gentleman from Iowa is recognized for a statement on the bill. I'd like to yield my time, Mr. Chairman, to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Russell. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. And I thank the gentleman from Iowa, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I certainly respect my colleague uh, from South Carolina. Uh, to make American flags in America is not un-American. Uh, and I would also remind my colleague uh, that Puerto Rico is America. It is not a foreign country. It is part of the United States with American citizens, and we respect uh, those citizens. Uh, look, the Department of Defense makes American flags. They are required to make it with all U.S. materials. We have convoluted patchwork of laws. Uh, my amendment, Mr. Chairman, uh, simply simplifies these laws and it makes it uniform to a uniform standard, which I think we can respect our military. And I don't think it's unrealistic to ask taxpayers uh, or to expect that taxpayers would not want American flags made in America. And with that, I yield back. I, I thank uh, the gentleman. Does the gentleman from Iowa yield back? Well, would the gentleman yield on that point? I yield back. Okay, the gentleman yields back. Is any other member wishing to be heard? All right. Uh, hearing none, uh, the question is now on the amendment in a nature of substitute. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. Uh, in the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Chairman, on that, I'd ask for a recorded vote. Okay. Uh, uh, a recorded vote is ordered and is previously announced. Further proceeding on the question will be postponed. Our next item for consideration is H.R. 4177, the Prepare Act. Clerk will designate the bill. H <coughs> H.R. 4177 to enhance the federal government's planning and preparation for extreme weather and the federal government's dissemination of best practices to respond to extreme weather, thereby increasing resilience, improving regional coordination, and mitigating the financial risk to the federal government from such extreme weather and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Without objection, so ordered. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, an original co-sponsor of the bill, Mr. Farenthal, for five minutes for a statement on the bill. Thank you very much. It's been my privilege to work uh, with uh, uh, Representative uh, uh, Cartwright uh, and uh, Representative Lance on this uh, important legislation. You know, extreme weather events are hard to predict and can a strike at a moment's notice. The district I represent in Texas uh, experienced that uh, just a couple of months ago with Hurricane Harvey. Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands have seen that with Irma and Maria. And preparing for these events uh, is, is a huge task, and it's not easy. Not all states or our, uh, or our territories are entirely prepared. And there are things that we need to consider you know, beyond just boarding up the windows and placing sandbags in front of the doors. 
in an effort to, protect, to help assist the American people with their preparedness and their response to inclement weather, uh, Congressman Cartwright uh, introduced the Preparedness and Risk Management uh, for Extreme Weather Patterns, Assuring uh, Re Resilience and Efficiency Act as a great acronym, the PREPARE Act. This legislation forms an interagency oversight council to establish government-wide priorities for preparing for and withstanding extreme weather events. The council will also coordinate with state and local entities to ensure their readiness as well. The PREPARE Act is important legislation that will increase government efficiency for responding to, to weather-related disasters at no taxpayer cost. In fact, these preparations are almost certain to save taxpayers uh, billions, if not billions, of dollars uh, at, uh, the, in da disaster recovery. And I want to thank Congressman Cartwright for working with us on this common sense legislation, and I urge everyone to support it and yield back the remainder of my time. I thank the gentleman for, uh, from Texas for his leadership. I also thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania for his leadership and Chair now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Cartwright, for a statement on the, on the bill. I thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Cummings, uh, Subcommittee Chairman Farenthold, uh, and uh, lead co-sponsor, Congressman Leonard Lance of New Jersey, and all the committee staff who worked so hard to get the PREPARE Act to this markup today. Mr. Chairman, uh, failing to plan is the same as planning to fail. This year, Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria brought unprecedented devastation to the communities across the South in Texas, Louisiana, Florida, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Wildfires have ravaged the West. Prairie states are at risk of tornadoes. Western states have been subjected to extended droughts and nearly every community is vulnerable to flooding. We've lost 282 Americans to extreme weather, and it may cost us well over $250 billion fully to recover. Federal government alone has already provided $52 billion in relief aid. And FEMA Administrator Brock Long testified before the Senate Homeland Security Committee earlier this week that we are currently spending more than $200 million every day on critical recovery efforts. But our federal government lacks the structure to develop a coherent, comprehensive, government-wide plan to prepare for the threats posed by extreme weather events. This current state of affairs puts American lives and American property at risk, and it is a source of massive fiscal exposure for our government. And we have a choice. We have a choice about how we deal with extreme weather events. We can choose to take a passive approach and do little to prepare. We can place all our bets on post-disaster response, mobilizing resources after every storm passes, after every flood subsides, after every wildfire burns out. Or we can choose to take a proactive approach. We can make a plan. We can build resilience into our communities. We can create a culture of pre preparation and planning. We can develop building codes that will withstand those 500-year floods. We can design resilient grids to minimize outages during hurricanes and keep the lights on in our hospitals. We can invest in natural natural infrastructure conserve, conserving wetlands that provide drainage and flood suppression. To me, the choice is clear. The path of resilience and preparation is the smart way forward. The pre this PREPARE Act is a common sense, bipartisan, zero cost solution that will help our nation weather the next storm. PREPARE creates a comprehensive oversight structure and a process to identify and minimize risk to our government and to our communities. It carefully coordinates the executive branch to implement government-wide resilience efforts. It directs agencies to, to develop extreme weather adaptation plans, to work proactively to mitigate risk and minimize federal fiscal exposure. It requires annual reports to ensure that we stay on the right path toward a resilient country. 
It removes barriers and creates opportunities to work with state and local planners to get them the resources and information they need better to prepare for extreme weather and protect their communities. And all of this is accomplished with zero new spending. Investments in resilience make smart business and economic sense, making our communities stronger, safer, and more livable in the future. Business leaders in our country know that preparation makes sense, which is why the vast majority of Fortune 100 companies have developed plans themselves to manage risks from natural disasters and extreme weather. Our government can and must do more to protect our nation from extreme weather events. This is exactly the common sense, bipartisan, zero cost solution Congress can focus on to improve our country, our communities, and our lives. So I urge my colleagues uh, to get behind the PREPARE Act and vote yes on this important bill. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I thank the gentleman. Does any other member wish to be heard? The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, is recognized for a statement on the bill. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank Representative Cartwright for his strong leadership on this bipartisan bill. The uh, bill addresses the federal government's need to prepare for extreme weather events. This bill is especially timely in light of the recent devastation from Hurricanes Harvey, Ir Irma, and Maria. The time to act is now. Every Congress, this committee <coughs> holds a uh, hearing with the Government Accountability Office to learn about the issues GAO finds uh, pose the greatest risk to the fiscal stability of the federal government. The purpose of those hearings is not just for us to listen, but rather for us to act on the information GAO provides. And Representative Clyde Wright has done just what uh, he was supposed to do. Um, the PREPARE Act is based on recommendations GAO has made in its biannual high-risk reports and that the Comptroller General has highlighted in testimony. This bill would require each federal agency to develop a plan to incorporate extreme weather preparedness into the agency's operations. The bill also would require the executive branch to coordinate its uh, efforts on extreme weather by establishing an interagency uh, council. The bill is bipartisan, supported by organizations across the political spectrum. I urge the committee to adopt the PREPARE Act, and with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Is there any other member wishing to be heard on the bill? Seeing none, the question is favorably reporting out H.R. 4177 to the House of Representatives. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, and the bill is ordered favorably reported. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The committee will now consider five postal naming bills on block. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that H.R. 1850, H.R. 2672, H.R. 2673 be ordered favorably reported to the House of Representatives. Without objection, so ordered. In addition, I ask unanimous con consent that uh, bills H.R. 3821, and H.R. 3893 be ordered favorably reported, each as amended by the corresponding amendment at the desk. Without objection, so ordered. The committee will now resume uh, consideration of H.R. 3121. Uh, the question is now on previously postponed amendment offered by the gentleman from Oklahoma. The, the clerk will call the roll.
Mr. Gowdy. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Duncan votes yes. Mr. Issa. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Sanford. Mr. Amash. Mr. Amash votes yes. Mr. Gosar. Mr. Gosar votes yes. Mr. Desjardins. Mr. Farenthold. Yes. Mr. Farenthold votes yes. Ms. Fox. Yes. Ms. Fox votes yes. Mr. Massey. Mr. Meadows. Yes. Mr. Meadows votes yes. <coughs> Mr. DeSantis. Mr. DeSantis votes yes. Mr. Ross. Mr. Walker. Yes. Mr. Walker votes yes. Mr. Blum. Mr. Blum votes yes. Mr. Heiss. Mr. Russell. Yes. Mr. Russell votes yes. Mr. Grothman. Yes. Mr. Grothman votes yes. Mr. Hurd, Mr. Palmer, Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Comer, yes. Mr. Comer votes yes. Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Gianforte, yes. Mr. Gianforte votes yes. Mr. Cummings, no. Mr. Cummings votes no. Ms. Maloney. Mr. Cummings votes yes. Ms. Maloney. Ms. Norton. Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay votes yes. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper votes aye. Mr. Connolly. Mr. Connolly votes aye. Ms. Kelly. Ms. Kelly votes aye. Ms. Lawrence. Ms. Lawrence votes aye. Ms. Watson Coleman. Ms. Watson Coleman votes aye. Ms. Plaskett. Ms. Plaskett votes aye. Ms. Demings. Yes. Ms. Demings votes yes. Mr. Krishnamurthy. Yes. Mr. Krishnamurthy votes yes. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin votes aye. Mr. Welch. Yes. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright votes aye. Mr. Desaunier. Mr. Desaunier votes aye. Mr. Gomez. Mr. Gomez votes aye. How is Mr. Jordan, uh, how is Mr. Jordan recorded? Mr. Jordan is not recorded. Mr. Jordan votes yes. uh, How is Mr. Sanford recorded? Mr. Sanford is not recorded. Uh, aye. Mr. Sanford votes aye. Uh, 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 hold on. Uh, uh, um, uh, Ms. I, I, I'm confused. This is a flag act, or the, this the is vote is on uh, the the amendment in the nature of a substitute on the flag act. Yes. Then may I amend that? That was a no. I apologize. I thought we were in the bill before. I apologize. Okay. Mr. Sanford votes no. Okay. How is Mr. Hurd recorded? Mr. Hurd is not recorded. Mr. Hurd votes aye. How is Mr. Ross recorded? Mr. Ross is not recorded. Mr. Ross votes aye. How is Mr. Welch recorded? Mr. Welch is not recorded. Mr. Welch votes aye. Is, how is Mr. Heiss recorded? Mr. Heiss is not recorded. Mr. Heiss votes yes. Is there anyone who is not voted who wishes to vote? How is Ms. Maloney recorded? Ms. Maloney votes yeah, aye. Is there any other member uh, who wishes to be recorded? The clerk will, will report the tally. <laughs> Thank you. 
On this vote, there are 35 ayes and one no. Okay, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question is now on favorably reporting H.R. 3121 as um, amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The bill is favorably reported as amended. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The committee will now uh, resume consideration of H.R. 4182. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 4182. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Gowdy. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Duncan votes aye. Mr. Isa. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Sanford. Mr. Sanford votes yes. Mr. Amash. Mr. Amash votes yes. Mr. Gosar? Yes. Mr. Gosar votes yes. Mr. Desjardins? Yes. Mr. Farenthold? Yes. Mr. Farenthold votes yes. Ms. Fox? Ms. Fox? Ms. Fox votes aye. Mr. Massey? Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Meadows votes aye. Mr. DeSantis? Aye. Mr. DeSantis votes aye. Mr. Ross? Mr. Ross votes aye. Mr. Walker? Aye. Mr. Walker votes aye. Mr. Blum? Aye. Mr. Blum votes aye. Mr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Heiss votes yes. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Russell votes aye. Mr. Grothman? Aye. Mr. Grothman votes aye. Mr. Hurd? Mr. Hurd votes aye. Mr. Palmer? Aye. Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Comer? Yes. Mr. Comer votes yes. Mr. Mitchell? Mr. Gianforte? Aye. Mr. Gianforte votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes no. Ms. Maloney? No. Ms. Maloney votes no. Ms. Norton? Mr. Clay? No. Mr. Clay votes no. Mr. Lynch? No. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Cooper? No. Mr. Cooper votes no. Mr. Connolly? No. Mr. Connolly votes no. Ms. Kelly? No. Ms. Kelly votes no. Ms. Lawrence? No. Ms. Lawrence votes nay. Ms. Watson Coleman? No. Ms. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Plaskett? No. Ms. Plaskett votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Krishnamurthy? No. Mr. Krishnamurthy votes no. Mr. Raskin? Yes. Mr. Raskin votes no. Mr. Welch? No. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Cartwright? No. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Desaunier? No. Mr. Desaunier votes no. Mr. Gomez? No. Mr. Gomez votes no. Is there any member not voted that wishes to be recorded? The clerk will report the tally. On this vote, there are 19 A's and 17 no's. Okay, the ayes have it. The bill is favorably reported, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be allowed to make necessary technical and conforming changes to the bills ordered, uh, reported today, subject to the approval of the minority, without objection, so ordered. If there is no further business, without objection, the committee stands adjourned.